views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Hola everyone, welcome to Open, the one and only show bringing the best of the Bronx, New York and the world straight to you. I'm Rina Valentin, your host the Café con Leche every Friday. Here's what's coming up in today's show. Leading things off, we'll talk about spring cleaning the body for the new season with health nutritionist and expert and author Nancy Addison. Then we'll sit down uh, with visual artist Andres Alvarez, who will share the inspiration behind most of his uh, original artwork. And later on in the show, Bobby C. brings us up to date with the latest headlines in the world of sports. And lastly, we'll learn more about BX Writers, a new project showcasing works from creative writers and poets from the Bronx and NYC. So sit back y prepárate. All this and more is headed your way because now we are officially open. Welcome to Open Everyone. I'm Rina Valenti, your host of Café con Leche for the next hour. Always inviting you to get social with us. Online, that is. Tweet us and follow us on Instagram at BronxNet TV or like us on Facebook at Open BronxNet Television. And of course, don't forget while you're there, follow moi on Twitter, Instagram, FB, Insta Stories, LinkedIn, Snapchat at Rina Valenti. <laughs> All right, so all month long for Women's History Month, we've been honoring women that have changed the course of history. And this week, we want to celebrate Sally Ride. In 1983, she made history, becoming the first American woman to go into space. This big achievement has inspired girls and women to pursue careers in science and technology. Let's give it up for Sally Ride. And of course, uh, we're all enjoying the weather. Spring, I think, has finally arrived. And while it's spring, uh, most people are spring cleaning their homes, but not, so, not necessarily cleaning out their most important home, which is, of course, the body. Well, today we have an award-winning author, a health and nutrition expert, who is going to give us some healthy eating tips that will help cleanse the body. And, uh, Without further ado, please welcome friend to the show, Nancy Addison. Hello and welcome, Nancy. Thank you. It's always great to be here. Oh, we love having you. We love that you always stop in here in the Bronx when you're in town, hailing all the way from Texas, doing wonderful stuff, transforming our society, transforming our bodies, and what a better way to kick off the spring. Yes, absolutely. After being locked in for the winter with uh, a lot of toxins being circulated in the air, we, we want to detox and really let go of a lot of these things that get into our body from breathing it in or from water or from different types of food. So we're going to talk about cleaning out our cells today so that we can really add the really healthy things back in and just have a healthier immune system. Okay, and let's talk body. about, while we're, we're discussing what these items are and how to do so, let's talk about the importance of doing that, right? Because I think it's important that people understand that the body transitions with the seasons as well, right? Absolutely, yes. And so being in the dark, or for lack of a better word here, you know, because the truth is, is like this very little sunshine, which mm -hmm. obviously uh, minimizes our vitamin D intake. And uh, I, I'll, you're the expert, I'm gonna let you take it over, but I just want everyone to understand that it's really important for us to make the time to, to just care for ourselves in, in places that aren't necessarily visible. Yes. Which is inside. Absolutely, and you are just right on it. 
Rena, always. Uh, the sunshine is critically important. In fact, there's a new study that showed that 77% uh, of cancers could be prevented if people would just go outside and get more sunshine. In fact, my, my little cup I use here for what I'm going to talk about first says, go outside, y'all. Yeah, that's what it says. <laughs> Of course, of course, it's got to have that draw, that southern draw. It's like, go outside, y'all. <laughs> I like, I like, right. cool. So um, uh, to start with, one of the basic things people can do first thing in the morning is before you even brush your teeth, right when you get up, we can do what we call oil pulling. And a lot of toxins get into our mouth in the middle of the night. And if we put some coconut oil, and I'm talking real pure coconut oil, nothing that's been fractionated, nothing that's been trans fatted. So you want to get one, they're usually white, um, but pure coconut oil. Just put a teaspoon of it in your mouth, and then you just swish it around for about 15 minutes. And I know that may sound really strange, but the lauric acid in coconut oil really supports your immune system, and it's antibacterial, antiviral. And, and so it absorbs a lot of the toxins, and then you spit it out after 15 minutes, and then you use a tongue scraper. And these are only a couple of dollars at the pharmacy, and you just scrape off your tongue and get it really clean. And that will this will make your mouth feel so fresh during well, the day. You know, I don't think we pay attention to our tongue uh, well enough. Uh, I know I don't, and I didn't even realize that they had these. So this is a tongue scraper mm -hmm. that is going to remove everything that's just been... You just scrape your tongue, uh -huh. and, and it, it is amazing. I usually do it two or three times, and I'll rinse it off between scrapes. And uh, then after you've done your oil pilling, this is really important. You want to get a clean, non-chlorinated, non-fluoridated water. And you can get something as easy as a zero water filter at Target or Bed Bath & Beyond for about $40. But you want to avoid plastics in your water. So you want to avoid the plastic water bottles because those have high synthetic estrogen. So that's something we want to detox from. So you put some water in a cup and then you want to have salt with that. And I know salt's a really confusing thing for most people. They think, well, I shouldn't have salt. But really, salt is necessary for our health and well-being. In fact, the, we can't hydrate effectively without salt. And so I just want to share with everyone the type of salt this is, which is Himalayan salt. And if you could just enlighten us a little bit about the, because I, I understand this particular salt comes with special benefits. Oh, absolutely. In fact, there's some other varieties as well, the Bolivian rose salt, and also there's a brand out of Utah called Real. And these are old oceans. These are old mined oceans that were before pollution when there was many more minerals and things in the, in the oceans at that time. So the, the salt from the oceans today usually has mercury in it. So you can get that mercury, de de and we, we're going to detox from that. But you want to get an old mine salt and it should have color because minerals have color. And if your salt is white, it could have been bleached, it would still be called sea salt, but you don't ever want to get white salt. You want salt with color. And the word electrolyte is simply a fancy medical term for the word salt. So that helps you hydrate. So you put some warm salt water right. in, some, in uh, your mouth and you gargle with it after you do your oil pulling. So and I then, want to make sure they understand. You're putting this in, inside of the water, preferably not a plastic cup, <laughs> and, <laughs> and you rinse, right? That's what she just said. I just want to make sure. <laughs> That's right. You gargle, and then you drink a big glass of it. And so when we wake up in the morning, we're really empty, and what we want to hydrate first thing. And as you detox, one of the most important things is drinking a lot of good quality water to help flush the toxins out. So I like to use coconut water as one of those because it's full of electrolytes, and it's incredibly good for us. So when you see the coconut water, okay, so first you rinse with this, and then you say you take a big gulp of the salt in the water. Yeah. Are you su su suggesting that you use coconut water to tr actually drink it? 
So coconut water is just something that's an alternative to regular water. A lot of people get tired of plain water, but coconut water was actually used for blood transfusions in World War II when they couldn't get blood. It's very close to our own blood physiology, so it's like very, very good for us. Yeah, that's in your and, book too. And it's right? very refreshing. <laughs> and so it's just a, an alternative to plain water, but um, the water first thing in the morning is incredibly important. And then with breakfast, I would definitely add some green powders to your, to your uh, breakfast or just have it mixed with a little water. But the, there's an indoor organic garden of Poughkeepsie that's making a new broccoli uh, powder that's raw and nutrient dense, full of uh, wonderful nutrients like sulfur, which helps carry oxygen mm -hmm. into our cells. And sulfur and vitamin C and some of these nutrients are incredibly fragile and get destroyed easily. And so when we add that to our diet, it goes into our cells, it flushes out the toxins, it, and it really helps detoxify us from a lot of different things. And then it also adds those nutrients to your body that you need in order to be healthy. So this is certified organic vegetable powder. And if you order it and tell them Nancy sent you, they'll give you a discount. All right, now, and there's only one Nancy in town. <laughs> <laughs> and the spirulina is a blue-green algae powder, and you can also use chlorella, but those are a wonderful at detoxification. And so it'll help detox you of these poisonous things that can hurt our body, like synthetic, artificial, the things from chemical fertilizers or pesticides. Uh, people don't realize that a lot of the light bulbs today emit a mercury vapor, so you're breathing that in. One of the things you can do to help detox from the mercury is glutathione. Uh, it's a, a, a <laughs> nutrient that is really great what at detoxification of mercury, but also vitamin C, which is prevalent Where in do a they lot sell of fresh this? fruits. So glutathione. Some of these you can find at health food stores, or I have to admit, I order a lot of things online. And if any of y'all have a question, you can always email me on my website and I'll be happy to, to let you know that. But you know, in the back of my books, I have a lot of resources. And so I, you know, uh, other than the recipes, I. I include how to find some of the things I I know, talk about. I love it. This is my, my go-to book, the uh, How to Be a uh, Healthy Vegetarian. Even though I'm semi-vegetarian, there's a lot of health tips in there, a lot, lots and lots of them. And then it's almost spring, so a lot of the farmers have greenhouses, so they're bringing fresh fruit and vegetables to the markets, even in the winter time sometimes, but local fresh food is gonna have more nutrient density to it. And you wanna eat organic, organic non-GMO. GMO. And the reason is because it's gonna have more nutrients in it. And when they use synthetic fertilizers and pesticides on your food, it destroys those fragile nutrients that are so essential for our overall health and detoxification. So vitamin C, sulfur, chromium, things that are absolutely critical for us being having a healthy immune system and a healthy thyroid. And so you want to have a lot of fresh fruits and vegetables. Citrus is really <laughs> great. And the antioxidants are the color. So look for fun things like purple potatoes and uh, you know bright oranges. And a lot of you might be juicing. If you're juicing, add the skin. The skin has more nutrients in it than the fruit itself. And if you're doing fruits, always eat the whole fruit because the fiber is so important. And that is a really important part of detoxification because the fiber in the food is going to absorb the toxins in your body and then help get them out right, of your right, body. And help the digestive system. Absolutely. Thank <laughs> you so much. We love when you're here. Oh my gosh. It's, it's like you're a walking encyclopedia. I say it all the time. So before we go, I did want to share uh, this wonderful news. Uh, you, your books are now uh, available in audio form. Yes, I'm very excited. I finally got them on audio. I know so many people like to listen to books today because it's easier when you're driving or riding in the subway <laughs> and so it makes it a lot easier and uh, so I'm very thrilled thank you wonderful thank you thank you Nancy for <laughs> always coming and sharing your knowledge with our viewers you guys it's so important to take care of yourself so for more healthy cleansing tips be sure to visit organic healthy lifestyle 
www.nancyaddison.com. And also, Nancy Addison's books are now available in audio form, as we just mentioned, and you can check that out on uh, platforms such as Amazon. All right, so uh, the Bronx Music Heritage Center put on performances that highlighted women of the Bronx in their special month. The performances were styled after the Petenera, a song style featured a different, uh, in different genres of Hispanic heritage. And reporter Darissa White has the story. Let's take a look. Filled the room. <laughs> This was a special performance held at the Bronx Music Heritage Center dedicated to women. The songs were styled after Pintanera, a song style featured in different genres of Hispanic heritage. According to the origin of the music style, it centers around a woman called La Pintanera, who owns her seduction power by the damnation of men. Tonight's program um, from March Women's History Month, we're going to talk about um, La Pintanera. It's a song form. It talks about a lady, a mysterious lady in Mexico and Spain. But um, we're going to have uh, artists who are uh, Mexican artists who are from the Bronx, who live in the Bronx now. And we're gonna, you're going to see a little bit of um, flamenco from Spain, a little bit of Mexican regional music. And um, that's going to be part of tonight's show. Pintanera has always been surrounded in superstition. It was believed that the performance always brought bad luck to anyone who performed it. The Bronx Music Heritage Center ignored the controversy around the performance and turned it into a way to highlight women of the Bronx in their special month. Reporting for BronxNet, Darissa White. Thank you, Darissa White, and that concludes our Women's History Month. All right, we had to take a quick break, but when we return, we'll sit down with a visual artist from the Bronx. neighbors and best friends. I love my sister. My heart, my heart doesn't, doesn't see race. race. Love, love is love. Our family is no less than any other family. make retirement happen. After all, you made this vacation happen. Double points with every purchase. Cleverly merging promotions. I love it. Cross-referencing travel sites and booking all your flights with those... Vouchers. I got us bumped. They were like, oh, But now they're like... 
Aloha. You aced this vacation. Now get the tips you need to get on track at aceyourretirement.org. Hello, and welcome back to Open, everyone. You know, always inviting you to get social with us. That's right. Tweet us at Bronxnet TV. And while you're there, tweet me too at Reina Valentin. Our next guest is a Dominican-born visual artist uh, hailing from the Bronx who dedicates his time to learn different art techniques through uh, and to master his work, that is, excuse me. And his recent work captures the essence of human condition and nature while at the same time exercising his right to break the conventional rules. And joining us to tell us more about his artwork, we welcome Andres Alvarez. Hello, Rena. Hello and welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Oh, thank you for being here and thank you for the lovely work you're doing documenting uh, through your style, right? So, yeah. all right. So I made this whole grand introduction uh, with regards to technique. Now, right. visual arts is not uh, my background. However, uh, I, I would like you to enlighten us a little bit about what those rules are. Well, sure. There's no, there's not really any rules. I'm a self-taught artist, so... What that means to me is that I didn't have any set boundaries set by any institution of academia. So I allow myself to explore whichever way I want it without limiting myself. So in a way, I allow myself to be multidimensional. So if I wanted to experiment with pencil work, I just went that route. If I wanted to experiment with ink, I went that route. Like right now, I'm doing a lot of uh, oil paint, which is the one that's stuck, which I, you know, Definitely love, but I just keep exploring and pushing in a different direction to see where it goes, pretty much. At what age did you realize that this was your calling? I have always been that kid that could draw. I have always been, you know, to the support of my parents and family and friends, of course. But it wasn't up until about six years ago when I started really digging in and exploring and figuring it out. I started painting about, like, four years ago. But right, so that, when you say exploring and really digging in, you're saying you've always drawn right yeah. you've always been drawing and so yes. you're self-taught yes and so you have certain techniques yeah. under your belt that you taught yourself and uh, about a couple of years ago you decided to fuse them and yeah. come up with your own style yes and so how challenging is it to sustain yourself doing art i don't 100 percent sustain myself doing art i'm working on that i'm a full-time teacher i'm a high school teacher so I'm really focusing on the pursuit of figuring out what it is that I should be doing as an artist or um, what it means to live as an artist. Because even though I have been able to do it my entire life, I really made it an actual part of my everyday life, like recently. Like I said, in the past six years, that's what I meant. When I said I started like, developing myself as an artist, like I have the ability, but I have, been pu have I been pushing myself enough? That's what I've been doing so far, doing, you know, doing that to the exploration, figuring out what it is that, you know, that I can do or should do. Which is a great segue into who are your inspirations? Like, where do you pull from? I have always been inspired by illustrators, mostly classical painters, like Rembrandt, illustrator being Frank Fraceta, comic artists, uh, Simon Beasley, uh, contemporary artists would be Cesar Santos, he's a Cuban artist, he does a lot of classical style work. Uh, Casey Childs, there's a lot of names that can pop in, can, the list goes on and on, but it's a very eclectic group, a very diverse group that they all kind of contribute somehow to the work that I do, one way or the other. And so we're going to be looking at some of your work now, okay. and I noticed that you uh, capture uh, a lot of celebrities. And so um, this one that we're looking at right now. That is actually, it's not a celebrity. Uh, there's a backstory to that painter that she I... She looks like a celebrity. She looks she's like... Not. Um, what is her name? The, the one who played uh, What's Love Got to Do With It? What is that actress's name? I'll figure it out later, but she does look like it. But who is this? Well, the character behind that painting has to unfortunately remain in the shadows because it's just part of a bigger project that I'm working on in conjunction with somebody else. So she's part of a bigger story that I'm working with. Uh, her name is uh, Marilis, that's the name of the character, which is part of a, of a story that's being developed. So she has to stay in the shadows a little bit, but she's not anybody that anybody will know, you know, uh, famous. So she, well, she resembles Angela Bassett. That's, Angela that, Bassett, That's, yeah. that's yes, the name I was yes, looking yes, for. Yes, yes, yes. She, wow, that's awesome. And, and we're looking at, and, and um, okay, we're going to go to the next one, and hmm, I wonder who that is. Mm. <laughs> Right, so obviously Cardi B. Uh, yeah, so every once in a while, you know, you 
through the media, whatever. There's some personalities that stick because of the of the way they are, because of you know the energy that they carry around. And she was definitely one of those people. And I was like, why not? You know, let me not take art so serious and let me use number one that painting is you just 36 by 48 inches one of my biggest paintings it's, it's beautiful and I, it took a lot of time i just that tired of me you know having making a silly face you know just have fun with it right you and know? so i noticed you use a lot of red um in your artwork uh as your background like yeah. what, what does what does that symbolize for you energy, it's energy. A, 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 i like high yellows blues reds anything that that represents that energy that I put into the painting itself. I want to like see through the paint itself. And we're looking at another woman. I notice you also capture a lot of women. Yes. Yes, of course, but claro. Yeah. <laughs> it's very challenging to portray, you know, that you know that essence of a woman accurately on a painting. It's very challenging, at least for myself. So that's usually, you know, what I give to. That's my daughter, Adriana, also an artist. Beautiful. She's uh, 13 years old. Uh -huh. That's a very recent painting of her, yeah. And uh, that's you. That's me, my studio. Uh, an artist said, I forgot the name of the artist, but he said that when you're not, when you run out of things to paint, you paint, paint yourself and something will come up. So I would do that every once in a while. I just you know, paint myself in my studio, but I also use it as a kind of a snapshot. Every once in a while, I would hit some type of mental benchmark in my, in my artistic pursuit. And, and I want to take a snapshot of that guy at that moment. And because that guy figures something out, let me just portray it, you know, I guess for future reference. So I will do that every once in a while. And so I, I understand you do self-portraits, right? Yeah. And so do you do self-portraits from actual images or do you also do self-portraits from uh, having people pose? That would be portrait. I don't do many. I'm open for commissions. I don't do them very often. I usually bring somebody in, do a photo shoot, and then on my own, I, you know, I do my, my own work, which is how I approach my work mostly mostly because of time constraints. It, right, I was going to ask, how yeah. long does it take you to, to create one of those self-portraits? Those are, that's what we're talking about, a couple of months' work, you know, factoring in, you know, uh, office hours that you have to be at work during the day and then deal with it, you know, after hours. So we're talking about a couple of months. Plus, it's oil paint, so it's a longer process by default. No matter how fast I want to push it, there's a process I have to follow. So it's a couple of months we're talking about. And what is the process behind oil paint? Is it because it's in layers? It's very layered, and you cannot push it either if you wanted to, because the, the paint is of the medium very slow drying. And if you, let's say, there's something called wet on wet, where you don't wait for the uh, paint to uh, dry before you apply the next layer. When you do that, one layer is blending into the other, so you have two colors blending into the other. When you're do, dealing with skin colors, you have to be very careful with that because if it, the, the paint is very sensible to whatever you're applying on top of it. So mm -hmm. I have to literally get it started, have a nice sketch, and just let it sit for a couple of days before I get back into it. So where and when can we see all of your work on display? That I've just recently decided to pursue a solo show. So I'm, I'm just gonna use this platform to put the word out and everybody who's interested in displaying my work. But it's something that took me a while to tell myself, okay, you're ready to do this. You're ready to you know, show this, put it out you know, in the world. I have been part of a couple of shows in the past, a few years ago, but it doesn't really represent it, what I, you know, how I feel right now about my work. So this is like a new stage. For so me. if somebody wanted to contact you to put you on display, where would they do so? They could go to my website, andresalvarezart.com. They can find all my information there. My Instagram, Andres Alvarez Art. You can just reach me through DMs. Talk to me. Yeah, talk to him. Talk That's to right. him. And his artwork is for sale. Yes, it is. All yes, it. right. All and you also it. do prints. I, I've been straying away from prints because I, it's been difficult for me to duplicate what I see on the canvas on, on digital uh, reproduction. So I've been very careful about that because I don't want to sell anything that's undervalued from the original artwork. So I want it to be as close to as close possible to the original to be, so I'm working on that, but I'm focusing on originals right now. That's awesome, I love it. Yeah. Integrity within your own work. I'm trying to. Absolutely, yeah. thank you so much for thank, being here, Thank Andres. you for having me. Absolutely, and yeah. for you guys, uh, for more on uh, Andres Alvarez, you can visit his website by going to andresalvarezart.com. <laughs>
Friedman Home hosted artist Fabiola jean Luis opening reception for Rewriting History, a Black Ancestral Narrative. Our Brooksnet cameras were there. Let's take a look. Rewriting History is an evolving series of photographs and sculptural paper constructed by Fabiola jean Louis. Fabiola jean Louis, a fine artist and photographer, explains to us where she draws her inspirations from. My inspiration comes from the love for the period, the opulence, the beauty. It also comes from um, the history that my country has. It, it comes from a lot of different places. Fabiola's passion to rewrite history and her desire of ongoing investigation seeks to question our understanding of history by revisiting the past, correcting historical records, and reimagining what an alternative narrative of black women would look like. The black beauty is just totally unrepresented, and when it is, it's not done correctly. And so this was important for not only black women, but for black girls to just look at something that they could say was really important and meaningful. The exhibition features a two-part series. One part focuses intensely on colored photographs of black and brown women in opulent scenes reminiscent of the 16th through the 19th century of European portrait paintings, alongside the delicately crafted paper gown sculptures. The second part of the series features a group of large-scale black and white Polaroids whose stark and elegant quality have an almost ghost-like presence. The pieces are amazing. The amount of time and work that you can see that she put into her pieces, you can just see it in just the dresses and the paintings and the portraits. Um, what it represents to me is regalness and showing um, black vulnerability in that aspect of regalness. Um, and it's just a beautiful show. The exhibition is a collaboration with the Andrew Friedman Home a 1920s mansion which used to house the formerly wealthy people who lost their fortune but wanted to maintain their luxurious lifestyle in their final years. The Andrew Freeman home is now owned and operated by the Mid-Bronx Senior Citizen Council. Director Walter Perrier explained what he hopes attendees would take away from this exhibition. I hope that one of the things that this exhibition does is make people realize, black people and non-black people realize, the relevance and the essential necessity of the black woman in culture for this world. This is a representation um, of a change. This is an example, an expression of the change that's happening. Um, you know, like history, blackness is not static, right? It is an ever-evolving thing. Fabiola is a storyteller whose tales begin with nothing more than simple paper. And from that, by controlling every detail, she builds scenes as real as you can imagine. Her critically acclaimed work has been featured in art and journalistic platforms. To find out more about her work, you can visit her website at www.fabiolajeanlouis.com. The exhibition will continue until May 11th, 2019. Doors are open to everyone and free of charge to experience the rewriting of history. The purpose of this exhibition is to portray a positive representation of blackness and what it means to be black. To find out more information about the exhibit, visit the website on the screen. Reporting from BronxNet, Fatu Sangari. Thank you, Fatu Sangari. We're taking a quick break. Stay tuned. Bobby C's Weekly Sports Roundup is coming up next.
angry giant. Behold the angry giant. Behold the angry giant. Behold the angry giant. It only takes a moment to make a moment. Take time to be a dad today. This is Bobby C. out at the big ballpark in the Bronx where the pinstripers are off to a terrific start on opening day. They lead off our look at sports. The Yankee designated hitter, the slugger, got the Bombers off to a great start with a three-run shot in the first inning. <laughs> it's unbelievable. You know, who would have thought I would be here for opening day? You know, I always thought I'd do it in a Cardinal uniform, but um, it was super frustrating. I ended up getting hurt last year, and I missed, and I missed opportunities to get called up with St. Louis. But, you know, to have that first opening day and hit home run opening day is pretty special. Um, you know, it's something I'll remember for the rest of my life. Aaron Judge was on base when Voight homered in the first. He goes two for three on opening day and scores three runs for the Bronx Bombers. As a team, collectively, we just had a good game plan, you know, going up against uh, uh, Andrew, man. He's, he's got some filthy stuff, you know, he's got a good two seam, you know, good little slider mix in there, big curveball. So for us, we just really you know, tried to get him on the plate, you know, because, you know, when we chase a lot of pitches, you know, he's, he's done some damage against us. So we had to make sure we just tighten up the zone and, you know, attack pitches that we could drive. The season opener was a chance for Yankee fans to also see Adam Adovino out of the bullpen. Did it sink in at that point that the pinstripes were real for you, you know? I think, I think it sunk in like in spring training, honestly, and today I just wanted to get in there and kind of get used to the mound and all that and just kind of do it for real. So, you know, it was a good time. That was the story in the Bronx on Thursday afternoon. Luke Voigt hit a first inning homer. Masahiro Tanaka finally got an opening day victory in his fourth try. And the New York Yankees started the season with a 7-2 win over the Baltimore Orioles. The pinstripers will complete the three-game set with the O's Saturday and Sunday. The one and only Mariano Rivera is impressed by this edition of the Bronx Bombers. The new Hall of Famer threw out the first pitch on opening day. We caught up with him for his thoughts on the Yankees in 2019 and what opening day means to the BX. You know, it's nothing better than, than being opening day in the Bronx. I was able to do that for a few years, you know, and every time that, that uh, we open here at home in front of our uh, fans, amazing. It's, it's nowhere to be but Yankee Stadium. It was amazing, you know, being, being in front of the fans for so many years, you know, and now being back as a Hall of Famer, it's a special. It's a special, and you know, I'm more grateful uh, to the fans that uh, have been there for me, you know, supporting me day in and day out for 19 years. 
Yankee fans could have hopped on a vintage train to the Bronx Bombers home opener for a trip down memory lane yesterday. The New York Transit Museum rolled out a 102 year old 1917 IRT Lovie train to shuttle fans from Manhattan to the South Bronx for the game. The historic train model was first operated by the Interborough Rapid Transit Company before the city took over in 1940. The fleet of some 1200 cars began service just a few years before the opening pitch was thrown at the original Yankee Stadium and transported passengers across the city for more than five decades. Subway cars featured ceiling fans and drop sash windows, ideal conditions for game day selfies with a throwback tie in on Thursday. How about a New York throwback in another borough? Robinson Cano homered in his debut at bat for the Mets, then added a late RBI single. Jacob deGrom outpitched Max Scherzer as each struck out at least 10 in a sterling matchup between winners of the past three NL Cy Young Awards and New York edged Washington in D.C. 2-0. Cano, the former Yankee, paying immediate dividends for the Amazons. New Mets closer Edwin Diaz had a shaky spring training with three home runs allowed, but he tossed a 1-2-3 ninth. The Mets are now 38-12 in their past 50 opening day games. They are a very good bet to win every year on opening day. Now is when the real games begin for them. The Mets continue their weekend series with the Nationals Saturday and Sunday. Cool stat of the day from that opener. Scherzer and DeGrom both had double-digit strikeouts. The first time opposing starters have had double-digit Ks on opening day since 1970 when Sam McDowell and Dave McNally did it for the Indians and Orioles respectively. Also the only other time in the live ball era. DeGrom certainly rewarded the Mets for their five-year $137.5 million contract extension this week. Meanwhile, the Nats played without Bryce Harper for the first time in a very long time. Bryce, of course, making his debut with Philadelphia after signing a mega contract during spring training. Harper went 0 for 3 with an intentional walk and failed to deliver a big hit. Phil still won, and Harper made some headlines this week by beating a Yankee off the field, too. The new number three is the new number one in jersey sales. Major League Baseball says Harper has the sports top-selling jersey, ending a two-year reign for Aaron Judge's number 99. I expect Judge to overtake Harper when the Bronx Bombers are winning the World Series this year. Time for some quick hitters from around the world of sports. On the NBA hardwood, it was a week to remember some oldies but some goodies. The Miami Heat retired Chris Bosh's number in South Beach while the San Antonio Spurs held an emotional jersey retirement for their own Manu Ginobili. Hard to believe their careers have come and gone so quick. Two legends of the game right there. Speaking of legends, the Knicks paid tribute to the late Cal Ramsey, a player, broadcaster, and community relations team member who was with the organization for five decades on Thursday night. More on Mr. Ramsey in the C-list. As for the game, the Toronto Raptors routed the Knicks for the second time in 11 nights, winning 117-92 to sweep the season series. In Philly, Joel Embiid had 39 points, 13 rebounds, and six assists to lead the Sixers to a 123-110 victory over the Brooklyn Nets on Thursday. Thursday night on the college hardwood. The first day of the Sweet 16 had two great games and a couple of duds too. Purdue and Tennessee put on an overtime classic and Oregon and Virginia were neck and neck all night. Meanwhile, Texas Tech stomped Michigan like nobody else has all year and Florida State just couldn't keep up with Gonzaga. The NCAA tournament continues tonight in the Sweet 16 game start at 7.09 p.m. with LSU versus Michigan State. On the ice, the Rangers host the St. Louis Blues. New York is a Eliminated from the playoff race, but is still looking to finish the season strong. Puck drops at seven. The New Jersey Devils visit Detroit. Those are two more teams with little, little, you know, little to play for Arena Bush. Pride alone as they are both eliminated from the postseason. That game gets underway at 7:30. In MLS action, NYCFC will face Toronto FC tonight. The Red Bulls will take on Chicago Saturday. And in the UFC, Conor McGregor is retiring again, at least for now. McGregor claimed he was retiring from mixed martial arts in an early Tuesday morning tweet. But a day later, he was spotted training in the boxing ring at a fight club gym in Miami, according to a video obtained by TMZ Sports. The timing of McGregor's announcement seems strange, as the Irishman has said as recently as Monday night on the, on the Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon that he was in talks for an MMA fight in July. Then, hours later, came the tweet signaling his retirement. Later on Tuesday, news broke that McGregor was under investigation for sexual assault in Ireland, per the New York Times. He was accused of assaulting a woman in December and was arrested the following month. Those are the headlines. We hit the C-list to honor Cal Ramsey.
The great Bruce Lee once said, a teacher is never a giver of truth. He is a guide, a pointer to the truth that each student must find for himself. I am not teaching you any, anything. I just help you to explore yourself. A great line from the greatest martial artist of all time. Well, Cal Ramsey was not only a great basketball player, he was a fantastic teacher and more, more importantly, an even better human being. Harlem and New York City basketball lost one of their greatest members Monday, March 25th with the passing of the legendary Ramsey. The 81-year-old died of cardiac arrest following a long illness. For the youngins out there who should know their history, Ramsey was a star player at NYU averaging 20.2 points and 17.5 rebounds. His record of 34 rebounds against Boston College has never been broken. After graduating in 1959, he was drafted by the St. Louis Hawks. He also played for the New York Knicks and the Syracuse Nationals. Ramsey was also known for his play at Rucker Park, most notably against players like all-time greats Connie Hawkins, Will Chamberlain, and Sonny Hill. But during my experiences with Ramsey, I will always remember the teacher, a place where his impact reached far beyond the basketball hardwood. Ramsey was a New York City teacher, became the Knicks broadcaster in 1972 after a brief career as a player. He then worked in community relations, serving as the team's ambassador for the last 28 years. He also held a position on NYU's basketball staff since 1983. Ramsey was inducted into the NYU Athletics Hall of Fame in 1978 and inducted into the New York City Basketball Hall of Fame in 1994. In 2010, the Knicks presented Ramsey with the Dick McGuire Knickerbocker Legacy Award. The Knicks honored Ramsey last night at Madison Square Garden during their game against the Raptors. A very deserving honor. The team will wear a memorial black ribbon on their jerseys throughout the rest of the season. Until his health declined, Ramsey was seen prominently seated at most Nick home games. You will be missed, my friend. Thank you for impacting so many. That's your sports. I'm Bobby C. Patriotism. It inspires passionate debate. It's worn like a badge of honor with good reason. Because it means love and devotion for one's country. But what really makes up this country of ours? It's the people. To love America is to love all Americans. This year, patriotism shouldn't just be about pride of country. It should be about love. Love beyond age, sexuality, disability, race, religion, and other labels. Because love has no labels. Maxi, but I prefer tripod. I was your above average four-legged homie and then wham bam minivan. Some people pity me. Now that's lame. I still run, fetch, and swim. And the ladies love me. I'm the ultimate wingman. Just don't ask me to high five.
welcome back to Open Everyone. Uh, BX Writers is uh, the name of Bronx Native's newest project that will allow writers from all over New York, New York City and the Bronx, of course, especially the Bronx, to provide short stories and poems that reflect themselves and the community with the main goal being to have all these stories and poems in one book. Joining us to tell us more, we welcome author and BX writer, creator, Josue Caceres. Hello, welcome back. Yes, thank you for having me thank again. Thank you. Oh my goodness, you guys <laughs> are doing really great stuff over there at Bronx Native. Yeah, you know, just always working uh, for the community. That's what it's about. Uh, just putting on for the community. Uh, I mean, technically, you guys are a, a, a storefront that sells T-shirts, and, and, but it, you're, you're kind of evolving into this cultural institution with all these new departments being created. <laughs> yeah, you know, we're just uh, trying to tackle everything, whether it's writers, whether it's music, whether it's art, you know, uh, entrepreneurship, you know, just trying to show people in our community that you're able to do these things and still be in the Bronx. I like that. That's yes. yeah. To bring it back home, of course. bring it back home, and pay Always. it forward. All right. So let's talk about this BX Writers the project that you created. Yes. So uh, BX Writers, it, it's a platform where we highlight and showcase writers, poets from the Bronx. You know, uh, me myself being a writer, uh, I love talking about where I'm from, which is the Bronx. I love highlighting my neighborhood and. We, uh, we have so many writers right here in the BX, and the Bronx is such a big, beautiful, diverse uh, place, and we have a story to tell. And far often, uh, we're underrepresented, whether it's in media, film, books, and we want to give that light, that platform, to art writers so they can have their story told. And not only that, you're offering the opportunity for them to be published, right? Because we, yes. in essence, we're, we're taking uh, responsibility for our own history. Yes. Which yes, is a lovely thing. So uh, how, how many of these poets are included in this creation, and where do you find them? Yes, yeah, so, um, you know, we have a beautiful platform, uh, which is the Bronx Native. And we use the Bronx, we use that platform to reach out to writers, telling them to submit you know, through, to me through email, through our website, and we've gotten like, you know, over a uh, hundred submissions at this point. Wow, you had a hundred submissions. So yeah. it's not, it's a, it's an open call is what you're doing. You're doing an open call through submission what, online or do you meet the writers or they're just submitting their work? Yeah, right now we're just asking for submissions, you know, to submit through us through email. Um, you know, writers all over New York City at this point. You know, we're just reaching out to them and, you know, just include as many writers as possible. So is it solely poems or is it a narratives as well? Is it memoirs? Is it, you know, various yeah. genres? Or? For right now, for the first book, we're asking for poetry, short stories, and, you know, just any creative writing that, you know, would fit within this book. And so how many writers are going to make the cut into the book? Uh, as many as possible. As many honestly. as possible. Yes. Okay, so you don't have a cap. No, I don't. I want to just give this light, this platform to as many writers as I can. Uh, yeah, that's just the main goal right now. Nice. Is there age factor involved? I mean, is this, it sounds like something that uh, is going to be like one of those, uh, what, what, what's the word I'm looking for? I'm looking for uh, something like, uh, not a classic, what, what would you reference a, a book that uh, you, you kind of hold on to, like a, for keeps? Um, I, I mean, we can reference yeah. it as an anthology, but that's not what I'm looking for. That's not the word I was looking for. I'm looking for <laughs> the word that it, it's like kind of one of those things that you keep forever. Yeah. I mean, you know, I for this first book, I just, there is no boundaries, you know. I want to just include everyone, you know. I want everyone to, to have, a, have their voice told, have their story told. And, you know, there's just, you know, I've gotten people telling me, oh, can my daughter submit? Uh, you know, older people, can they submit? I'm like, just just send it in. I'm all excited about this, right? And, and the reason <laughs> I'm, I'm lost for words is because I, I'm trying to visualize uh, just coming across this book that has yeah. all these different age brackets, right? Documenting our times, mm -hmm. sharing the stories of our times from the actual sources, yes. and, and just being kept uh, to preserve uh, our, our history. Yeah, that, you know, that's honestly what we love, and that's what we do at Bronx Native as well. You know, we, we like to bridge the gap you know, from where we came from uh, to where we are now. And that's what I want to do with this book, is bridging that gap, 
and have uh, whoever reads the book, whoever picks it up, can read stories from, you know, back in the days in the BX, in Harlem, in the Heights, and read the stories from kids now. And kind of feel reminiscent of being of there. Of course. I love it. And about. so you're one of the authors also that are yes. going to be published. I understand you brought something that you, we're going to be the first to hear it, right? Yes. Right? Yes. So it's still, uh, it, what is it? It's in unreleased, its first draft? Unreleased, yes. It's unreleased first draft. in its first draft. Yes. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm also working on my third book, which will, re uh, it will be released this fall. And I have an unreleased poem here, which I would love to share with everyone here today. We're so looking forward to it. All right, Jose Caceres, everyone. <clears throat> I'm from a place where we witnessed the birth of culture, where vultures tried to erase and displace. Concrete jungle where the bus is delayed. It's either show time or selling snacks on the train. I'm from a place where we recite our first rhymes, where they tell you make it out the hood or resort to crime, where you sleep to the sound of shouts and cops, where you hang at bodegas and barber shops, where growing up you'll fight and they'll take your phone, where La Vecina is the night's watch and mom's is up to you home. I'm from a place of do rags and putting Tim's to the floor, where a dollar got you an entire meal from the store. Where rent is due, the man says you gotta pay. Where mothers work in three jobs so the kids can eat another day. I'm from a place where we lost many brothers, but we forget your stereotypes because we look out for one another. I'm from a place that was burnt and bridges built over our heads, where they wanna gentrify the hood but the idea is getting torn into shreds. Where the kids are playing, hydrant spring, MTA, I ain't paying, grandma praying. This is my hood, my radio is always playing. And I love the Bronx, so I'm always staying. Nice, yes. Thank you. Josué. Thank you. Thank Bronx you. native. Thank you. We're out here. Puro de corazón. BX. <laughs> BX. Yeah. And the word I was looking for was a collector's item. Mira que cosa. Okay. Such a simple word. I was saying classic, but it was like a collector's item. Collector's yes. item. All right. So w when uh, people can still submit, right? Yes. People can still submit uh, Josué at BronxNative.com or you can submit through uh, BronxNative.com slash BX Writers and also follow us on Instagram, uh, BX Writers and of course, the Bronx native. Absolutely, yes. Bronx educated. Woo! Josue Casares, everyone. Here. All right, once again, uh, BX writers, they're currently looking for writers. They're looking for more writers. So if you're interested in submitting your work, be sure to visit bronxnatives.com, and then you can go in there and click on BX writers, and you'll, you'll figure it out the rest of the way. All right, that is our show today, mi gente. Thanks to all our guests for coming through, and to you, our viewers, for tuning in. If you missed any part of the show, you can check out the Recablecast tonight and 24 hours a day at BronxNet.tv. I'm Rina Valentin, and from all of us here at Open, may the universe provide paz, prosperity, y amor. Adios, everybody.